Welcome Newsweek friends. I am Dory Clark and I am here today with Lindsay Pollack. Lindsay is the New York Times best-selling author of the just released book Recalculating, which is awfully timely since we uh since you know, we're still in the middle of a pandemic and we all need to recalculate. So today we're going to be talking about how to navigate your career through changing and challenging times. We also want to thank you for being here. And so um, for all of you who are tuning in live, please go ahead and type into the chat box and let us know uh, who you are and where you're tuning in from. We'd love to give you a shout out and say hello. So Lindsay, it's a pleasure to have you here. How are you doing? Thank you so much. I am so excited. I'm a fan of the show and I'm thrilled to be here. Welcome everyone. Fantastic. So Lindsay, I am curious, we were just talking before you came on live about how recalculating actually got its start. You told me, now I have written multiple books and I know that on average, it takes between a year and a half and two years for a book to go from selling the proposal to the book being on shelves. You told me that you came up with the idea for recalculating in May of 2020, and I am literally now holding it in my hands on March 25th, 2021. How did this happen? Uh, give, give me the, the 411 about the genesis of your new book. I love starting there. You know how suddenly when like Meghan Markle's in the news, there's suddenly five books about her, and I was wondering, how do they do that? I learned how you do it um, very, very, very quickly. So um, I'll tell you the, the brief origin story. In May of 2020, well, in March of 2020, like many professional speakers and authors, I went from having a fully booked calendar of speaking events to an absolutely empty calendar. And it was terrifying um, and frustrating. And I was trying to figure out how do I pivot my business, my life, my career to this new environment where they're not going to be big conferences anymore. Um, and my natural instinct in any situation is, well, I've got to call lots and lots of people and ask them what they're doing and write about it. Um, and that was sort of the, the basis of the idea of this book. I always try to write the book I wish I had. And the, wish, the book I wish I had in April of 2020 was something about how to pivot in totally uncertain times. Um, in May, I started to write a one page proposal and I was sitting in my apartment in New York City looking out the window. I had finally moved my desk in front of a window. That was my big aha moment of pandemic lockdown life. And I looked at the cars on the street and I just had this image of that time when you're driving and there's traffic or you go down the wrong road or for some reason you can't keep going and your GPS says recalculating. And I just had this image of all of us in our cars doing our thing. And suddenly every GPS said, nope, you can't go that way anymore. You have to recalculate. And that was the spark of the book. I have never, ever named a book before I wrote anything. I'm terrible at naming books. That's where the idea came from. And it gave me optimism, to be honest, which I think is a really important part of this book, which is I don't really have a good sense of direction. So when my GPS says recalculating, I always feel comforted because it says, that's okay. Like you can't go this way, but there's another way and we'll get you where you need to go. And so that was kind of the mission and the vision I had in my mind for this book. I love that, Lindsay. That's so poetic. It's uh, it's actually a much much gentler than uh, one of my GPS experiences, which is uh, I was driving through Spain once, and it kept taunting me by saying, "Take the roundabout to the roundabout," and I and I did not understand what that meant. Uh, so uh, so that was a few hours of being lost. So when when it was recalculating, I thought, "Oh no!" But I love your interpretation of of <laughs> the benevolent recalculating. That's that's one. Wonderful. And I just want to give a shout out to some of the great friends who are tuning in here. Todd from New York is here. And so is Anna from New Hampshire, Mary from St. Petersburg. I see Diraj is here from India, Mary from Kokomo. I think that's in Indiana. Uh, and uh, we have Sheridan from uh, Silicon Valley, Linda from North Carolina, and Irina from Belarus, among others. So if you are uh, joining us, please type into the chat box and say hi. We'd love to hear from you. And we'd also love to get your questions for Lindsay Paul author of the new book, Recalculating. Now, Lindsay, I know from being, being out there, 
you know, sometimes, sometimes metaphorically <laughs> in the COVID world, but from being out there, I am hearing from a lot of people that one of the big issues uh, that's a central part of the recalculating we need to, to do is around mindset and motivation. It's so many people feel like over the past year, it's just been a slog. It's been a grind. Maybe they want to make changes in their life. Maybe they have to make changes in their life, but nonetheless, very hard to kind of uh, muster the will to do it somehow. How do you think about mindset during these times and how does that factor into recalculating? You know, I'm almost embarrassed that this is my fourth book and it's the first time I've written more than a sentence or two about mindset. And I wrote this book very quickly. I had to write it in three months in order to get it out quick enough to help people during this situation. And it was almost like I didn't have a choice but to start where I needed to. And chapter one, is adjust your mindset. It is not easy to move forward and work and build a career or change jobs or even just go to your existing job in this time. I mean, like raise your hand, everybody, if you've been unmotivated at some point during COVID, it's, it's natural. And so in order to move forward with a resume or networking or interviewing or all of the like tips that I wanted to provide, Every single person I spoke to said, you've got to start with your mindset. You've got to start with how am I going to get up in the morning and have a good attitude? And so I think that recalculating metaphor can be very helpful to say, I probably can't do things the way I've always done them, but there's something else I can do. And I am a huge fan, as many people are, of Carol Dweck and her work on growth mindset. So I write about that in the book. And what I like about growth mindset is as opposed to a fixed mindset, which says, I'm not good at change, I'll never get a job, I've always done this, so I can't do anything else, nothing will change. Growth mindset starts from the belief that really anything is possible if you put in the work. And so she uses this one tiny little word yet to change any fixed mindset to a growth mindset. So I'm not good at change yet. I, um, you know, I don't think that I'll get a job yet. And what that implies is, if I do something, if I take an action, that now becomes possible. And then it goes from, I can't, I can't, I can't, to, all right, what do I have to put on my to-do list to make this happen? So I really tried in the book to give really, really small micro suggestions of how to move forward so that you could just get out of your head and into a to-do list and action. I love that. That's so helpful, Lindsay. Thank you so much. Uh, so I just want to greet some folks who are tuning in here. Yolanda's here from Arizona. Leslie from Tampa. Vicky's here from Texas. Lorraine is uh, is here as well. Mia from Chicago. Sue Sheetal is from London. Uh, Terrence is here from Maryland. I love that. Susan from Colorado. Rosinda from Mexico. So uh, so great to see all of you here. Welcome. And uh, and actually, I'm I'm curious, uh, Lindsay. Let's let's make this about you. Anna was just curious. She said. What about, what about you, Lindsay? What if you're feeling bored? What if you're feeling unmotivated? How do you snap yourself out of that? Okay, so let's go there. Let's go bored. there. Who hasn't been bored during COVID, right? Um, so I have a couple strategies. One is I'm a huge fan of accountability partners. I have certain friends where we have sort of agreed, informally or not, when we are bored, when we are unmotivated, to text each other. And I have one friend, Ilana, who is sort of my, my guru self-help partner. And I'll say, Ilana, I can't do anything. I can't do anything. I'm miserable. And she'll either say, you know what? Sit in it for an hour. Go watch a Netflix show. Or she'll say, come on, Linz. You promised you were going to get that book chapter done. You got to do it. You got to do it. Um, my mom and I used to have something, especially when I was in high school and college, she called it sandwiching which is I would call her before doing something scary or annoying or irritating. And then I would call her after I did it. So I'd call her and she'd say, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. And then after it was done, I had a plan to call her and say, I did it, I did it. And that made the thing a little less scary and bothersome. I also think sometimes you have to sink into the boredom. I have watched you know, the entire season of Ted Lasso in one sitting, I'm not gonna lie. Sometimes you have to do that. And some of our um, timeframes have certainly been altered by COVID. And one of the um, elements I talk about in the book is if you've been laid off or if you are starting a business or if you're doing something different, you also have to give yourself time for that transition to wallow or to rest. And I think that's really important. So sometimes if you're mindfully resting or mindfully being bored, that's a good thing. But if I don't want to be bored, I really rely on, on my friends and my network to help me get out of it. 
Love that, Lindsay. Thank you so much. And if you are enjoying this conversation with Lindsay Pollock, uh, please hit the like button, hit the share button so that your friends and colleagues can benefit as well. If you want to learn more about Lindsay and her work, go to lindsaypollock.com. And if you want to make sure that you are signed up and you get reminders about these great weekly conversations that we have uh, here for Newsweek, our show every Thursday at noon, it's called Better. Next week, we have uh, Tony-nominated Broadway producer, Ray Rachel Sussman, uh, just go to doryclark.com. You can sign up for my newsletter there and get some free self-assessments and you will be notified about upcoming episodes. So feel free to type your questions into the chat box for Lindsay Pollock. And Lindsay, in the meantime, I am actually curious. So a challenge that a lot of people face, of course, when they are recalculating, if they if they are doing a reinvention, and this is something I, of course, have spent a lot of time thinking about as well, because I wrote a book called Reinventing You. Uh, but I know that, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Props, props are plenty, right? We've, we get, we get so many props. It's amazing. <laughs> but I hear from a lot of people that if they are looking to change jobs or change careers, a big challenge is that, you know, maybe they don't have a lot of experience in the new realm that they're looking to move into. And so how, how do you account for that? You know, what do you, what do you need to do in terms of your own head and feeling okay and sort of getting over imposter syndrome? And what do you need to do to convince other people to give you a chance in this new realm? Well, I think those are two separate questions, right? Which is what do you actually have to do to move from one career or industry or job function to another? And what do you have to do in your head? I think those are two very different conversations. So I did a lot of research on this. How hard is it really? And what a lot of experts, econ economists say, is often the transition is less hard than you think. And if you can let me go a little bit further with the recalculating metaphor, you know, when your GPS says recalculating, it never sends you back to your driveway to start over completely. It always takes you from where you are. You have built skills and knowledge and experiences in whatever job you've done. Even if you are coming right out of high school or college, you have some experience and skills under your belt. So um, two thoughts. One is I'm a really big fan of taking an assessment test, which really sort of pulls out what are your skills or strengths. I have a free offer in the book from a company called Capfinity. If you go to my website, lindsaypollock.com slash SP for strengths profile, it's right on the uh, homepage of the website under recalculating, you can take a free assessment that will show you what those transferable skills are. They're not related to a job, but are skills that you could port. The other factor that a lot of the economists said is that a lot of careers are much closer to other career paths than you might think. And I'll give you an example. I spoke to a chef who couldn't get work during COVID because so many restaurants had shut down. And he kind of admitted, as a lot of people did, that he was kind of wanting to make a change anyway. And COVID just sort of was that little push that he needed to actually do it. And he wanted to do something different. And he went back to his college career center, which is another tip, no matter how long ago you graduated, you can always go back to your alma mater for services, assessments, coaching, resume critique, interviewing, and so on. So he goes back to his college career center and said, I don't really wanna be a chef anymore. I wanna do something different. He took an assessment test. And one of the areas where he really excelled was logistics because he had ordered ingredients and he had managed the staffing and he was really good at logistics. So he didn't have to go back to school and get a second degree. He took a one credit online course in logistics, was able to add that to his resume. They helped him pull out the logistical things he had done as a chef. So he stopped talking about flavor and cooking and started talking about ordering and vendor management and he was able to get a really great high paying job in logistics. So it's about the terminology that you use between jobs, but it's also about realizing you very rarely have zero skills in one field that need to go into something else. And, and just a final thought, particularly for early career professionals, experience is a really broad term. Extracurriculars are experience, taking classes is experience, volunteering is experience, it doesn't have to be full-time paid work in order to count towards another career. I hope that all makes sense. 
It does. That's very helpful, Lindsay. Thank you very much. And I just wanted to uh, say hello to some folks who have tuned in to join us. We have Sean from the Adirondacks. We have Dee from Calgary. We have uh, Fatina from from Tehran. So welcome. We're so happy to have all of you here joining us and New York Times bestselling author, Lindsay Pollack. Now, a great question came in, Lindsay, from Jeff. And I think this is probably on a lot of people's minds. Jeff wants to know, how would you advise rerouting inside a company when you're socializing? an intrapreneurial idea. Um, so, so recalculating is not just for people who want to get a new job. It also may apply to people inside an organization. What are your thoughts about that? Jeff, thank you for the question. And I love all the Ted, Ted Lasso fans in the crowd. I feel like this is now an informal Ted Lasso watching session. Um, Jeff, thank you for that question. I added an entire chapter in the book on people who want to recalculate within their current organization, because that is a great thing to do. And particularly a lot of big companies, it is like changing jobs or careers, even in the same organization. Um, so I spoke to a lot of HR professionals and recruiters about this issue. And they said, you do have to be careful. And their biggest advice was to absolutely share your ideas and your suggestions and your desire to maybe change directions or become an entrepreneur in your company. But you have to almost overemphasize that you are delightfully happy in your current position and very happy to keep it and continue contributing. And you have some ideas of what you might want to do next. So the trick is to never act like you're out of there if this doesn't happen or you only want to make this change and you're not really into your job anymore. You have to first emphasize that you are happy with what you're doing and then share those ideas. I think it's also a really good exercise in understanding internal politics, which is you got to talk to the right people. You've got to get the stakeholders holders involved. You've got to talk to them in terms of the value that it would bring to the business, not because you want to start an internal career coaching practice, but because the value and the mission of the company will be served best by this entrepreneurial idea. So really put your focus on what the company would be thinking about when they hear your entrepreneurial ideas, rather than focusing too much on what it is that you want. Of course, we want you to get what you want, but that's the strategy to get there. Such good advice, Lindsay. Thank you very much for that. And please type your questions into the chat box for Lindsay Pollock. We'd love to hear what's on your mind when it comes to navigating your career through changing times. Now, Lindsay, I'm curious, uh, you wrote this book, Recalculating, you wrote it fast. How have you recalculated during the pandemic? What are the ways that you have personally applied the strategies that you talk about? Uh, some people have commented, and I'm loving the comments, that I'm very optimistic. It's a choice. Like, this sucked in March and April. I love being a speaker. I love traveling. I love being out there. I was not happy to lose all that business and suddenly have to recalculate. So I had a lot of feelings about that. Um, I work with a coach. I work with a therapist. Um, I talked to a lot of friends, and I talked to a lot of other people in our speaking um, and author business about what they were doing. So first is um, I've always found opportunities in writing. So I doubled down on writing as opposed to speaking, including writing the book. Um, I went to obviously virtual programs very quickly. And one of the things I learned from just chatting with my clients is they wanted shorter programs. So they wanted 30 minute virtual sessions. Um, I think in my original slide deck on um, career management, I had one slide on virtual work. Well, guess what? That one slide became an entire presentation. Um, what I'm grateful for and what I really recommend to everybody is I think the best piece of advice I've ever gotten in my whole life was I was in college and somebody said, no matter what, keep building your contacts, keep your relationships. And I think what really propelled me from an empty calendar to getting back on track again and being able to pivot is I had really deep decades long relationships with clients where I was able to call and say, I know you're not doing any conferences this year, but what can I do? What can I offer? What might you need? And people were able or were willing to give me that opportunity to pivot and change because they knew me and they knew that I would step up. So I would say virtual programs, uh, group coaching programs, a lot more writing, a lot more consulting and a lot more shorter term contracts where normally someone would have me on a 12 month speaking contract. They could only book one event and I took it and did it gratefully. Um, and moved on from there. So there was a ton, a ton of pivoting, but there were also a lot of like peanut M&Ms and, and watching Netflix and all the other stuff. It was not all beauty and wonder and everything moving forward. I was, I was frightened for a while, but I knew that my contacts were gonna be the answer of how to get out of it. 
Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think I think that's really wise. And uh, Annette says, uh, all these transitions, sometimes we just have to accept loss and make the space to grieve to move along a healthy path, which I, I think is really yeah. true. Um, such a powerful observation, Annette, because you know, we want to be positive, we want to be optimistic, but you can't necessarily turn on a dime and do that. So, uh, so there does need to be space for those transitions. So really important point there. Uh, so if you are enjoying the conversation, again, please uh, hit the like button and uh, type your questions in for Lindsay Pollock. Again, she is the author of the brand new book, Recalculating. You can find out more and get it at lindsaypollock.com. And if you want to make sure you never miss one of these uh, great sessions, you can follow me and join my LinkedIn newsletter. Just hit the subscribe button uh, underneath the banner at doryclark.com slash LinkedIn. So Lindsay, Lindsay, a question that I have for you, speaking of LinkedIn, is that for a number of years, you were actually an ambassador for LinkedIn. You have a lot of experience uh, talking about how job seekers and, and professionals looking to level up their careers can use the platform effectively. During a time of recalculating, what are your thoughts about LinkedIn specifically and how professionals might uh, might reach out and connect and, and use LinkedIn to help further their careers? I love LinkedIn. We're on the LinkedIn platform now. I'm an unabashed fan. Um, I was an ambassador for LinkedIn. I taught people how to use it from 2009 to 2015. And it's actually pretty remarkable how much is the same that is just evergreen. Um, and so a couple tips. Number one, I think the most important piece of real estate about you on the internet is your LinkedIn headline. Those words under your name are so tremendously important. Dory is the master of personal branding, but most people are not going to read beyond that. So make sure that whatever it says in there is exactly what you want people to know. And if you're pivoting or career changing, put the thing you want first. Don't say former teacher and blah, 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 seeking to pivot. No, say that you are an electrical engineer pivoting from teaching. So put the put the headline first um, is number one. So really spend a lot of time on that headline, more in my opinion than on the rest of the profile. Um, second thing is always, always, always customize your outreach requests to people. Just a sentence. Hey, Dory, really enjoyed your show. Hey, great to meet you at the career fair. Um, we're an alum of the same school. Give people a reason to show that you're not just writing Dear Occupant, that you are putting something personal. And the third piece is something I learned from Reid Hoffman, who's one of the founders of LinkedIn and just a, a tremendous business person and generous networker. He said he thinks people use LinkedIn wrong for networking. He said, most people go into LinkedIn and say, what can I get today? And he said the way he uses LinkedIn and what he recommends, and this completely changed my view of the site and really online networking, in any networking, he said he goes in and says, what can I give? Who can I help today? And if you approach it from that perspective, I can like Dory's posts, right? I can thank somebody for their help. I can forward a job to somebody who might like it. I can post an article that would be helpful. Yes, you can be self-promotional. Yes, you can share information about yourself. But if your general motivation is how can I be of service to people in my network, I think that comes back to you in spades. And I think people see that you are a generous person and you want to be mutually beneficial. So that really shifts my mindset about how to use LinkedIn. Super helpful, Lindsay. Thank you very much. That's great. And a question came in from Wendy that I'd like to turn to. She wants to know, does recalculating work if you're self-employed? Uh, for, for people who are entrepreneurs out there, how might we recalculate or uh, leverage the, the power of the recalculating principles? My publicist, Dory Clark. Um, thank you for that. Um, my hashtag is we are all recalculating. So yes, I think it absolutely applies to self-employment. I am self-employed um, and I recalculated by shifting my business to where the opportunities were during COVID. Um, I actually uh, just spoke to a gentleman who was a career coach and he said people didn't wanna pay his high fees that he charged for coaching. And I said, well, maybe you recalculate by offering micro sessions or offering group sessions or offering different ways for people to access you. So I didn't recalculate my expertise or my line of business. I recalculated how I deliver that to other people. So I think everybody can recalculate in whatever situation you're in. It might just not be a complete shift of job function or industry. It might be how you offer your services or how you price them or who your customers are. Awesome. I love that. That sounds uh, that sounds great, Lindsay. And another question came in from Annette. Uh, she is curious, 
I, what what do you recommend if you'd like to add meaning to work, especially in large organizations? Uh, you know, during the pandemic, during COVID, it, it could be a good time for corporate social responsibility programs. So what are your thoughts about meaning and purpose at work and how that fits into the concept of recalculating? I love that question. I think there's going to be a renaissance. I was just speaking to somebody at the American Red Cross. I don't know if you've seen the new advertising campaign for the Army National Guard. I mean, I just think people want to help. The applications to medical school are way up, nonprofits. So my hope is that corporations will offer wonderful opportunities for corporate social responsibility and volunteering, but they might not. So you can't rely on that. I think sometimes in your job, yeah, you might be able to find meaning in your everyday work, but sometimes you can't. And so you can find meaning in your life that may not be part of your job. So maybe it's that you do more mentoring of other people in your organization. Maybe you join an affinity group and become an ally to people from underrepresented groups in your company. Maybe you join committees that are very interested in volunteering. Maybe it's not part of your job, that's just the way life is, and you find a nonprofit or a charity or a cause that you believe in outside. Maybe you simply follow a lot of causes on Twitter and you retweet them and feel good about that support all the time. So. Sometimes, rather than hoping that your company will step up, you have to find ways to add meaning to your career. And I just want to put a shout out. Um, I'm a huge fan of mentoring early career professionals, particularly those who are first in their family to go to college or have professional careers. I think mentoring is a phenomenal way to give back immediately um, that doesn't require your company to be formal about it. Really nice and really helpful, Lindsay. Thank you for that. So I am also curious, nowadays, one of the things that we are all forced to do uh, because there's so few in-person events is virtual networking. Now, this is very much a new skill set for a lot of people over the past year. They're having to figure out uh, Zoom and all the, all the different technologies. What are your thoughts about how to network effectively in a virtual environment? Are there best practices or uh, strategies that you might share with us as we are all recalculating? So in some ways it's different, but in some ways it's the same, right? Which is authentic connections. And I think one of the really small tactical suggestions I would make is, I think now a year into the pandemic, we have all realized that some people like Zoom, some people like on camera, some people can't stand it anymore. So I always now ask, you know, I'd love to connect with you. What's your preferred method? Do you wanna go for a walk and talk? Do you wanna text? Do you wanna talk on Zoom? Do you wanna talk on the phone? So I think giving people the opportunity to pick their method and not put pressure on them. Nothing is worse than a Zoom call you don't wanna be on camera for. So number one, I think is choose method. Number two is I think a lot of people, particularly job seekers, are way too formal and ask too much in the first outreach. You know, like, dear so-and-so, here's my resume. Here's what I want, I want to talk to you. It's like, no, how about, hi, I'd love to chat with you for 10 minutes and hear about your career. So I think virtual networking is even more informal and sometimes comes across as trying too hard if you go too formal too fast. So I would treat it as if you ran into somebody on a street corner or at a cafe and said, oh, it's so good to see you. We'd love to connect. That first interaction is just to kind of establish that. And then you can get a little bit more professional in the next one. So I would say in social media, just err a little bit towards the friendly and um, personal as opposed to getting too formal too fast. Really good advice. Always a great thing to take to take things slow, especially in a fast moving world. People appreciate that. So I am Dory Clark. I have been here. Uh, we have time for probably just one more question, but I've been here with Lindsay Pollack, the New York Times bestselling author of the new book, Recalculating. If you want to learn more about Lindsay and her work, be sure to go to lindsaypollock.com. And if you want to make sure that you never miss an episode of Newsweek Better, you can sign up for the mailing list at doryclark.com and get a self-assessment in the process. So Lindsay, the last question that I have for you, which is probably on a lot of people's minds, you've been talking about how we're all recalculating sometimes there's kind of a, a fine line that we have to walk. And I'm curious if you have advice for us, you know, some of some of whom just may be a little frustrated or struggling over the past year. How do you know when it's time to pivot as compared to when you should just keep your head down and and work through a tough time and maybe it'll get better in the end? How do you think about that? You don't know. So you just have to try it dip a toe. Um, I'm somebody who went from working five days a week to four days a week to three days a week to two days a week to one way a week when I started my business. Dip a toe, 
give it a try, see how it feels. If you like it, take another step. If you don't, maybe it's not the right time. It's short and simple. I love it. And uh, and I see here that uh, we already have a fan. Linda Jansen says, oh, I just ordered the book. Thank you. So, well done, Linda. That's great. Uh, so Lindsay Pollock, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you all for being here as part of Newsweek's Better Show every Thursday, noon Eastern, 9 Pacific. And next week, we're talking to Tony-nominated Broadway producer Rachel Sussman. Lindsay Pollock, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, everyone, for joining. See you all next week.